morning, everybody. And so, unfortunately, all of your real preachers are out this morning, so you guys are stuck with me, at least uh, for a few minutes. Um, so we're going to look at Psalm 8 a little bit this morning, uh, but before we do that, let's pray. God, give us the eyes to see what you would have us see, ears to hear what you would have us hear, that we may be the people you have called us to be. Amen. So a couple of months ago, a team of scientists as part of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration announced that it was able to capture for the first time an image of one of the most powerful and mysterious forces in our universe, a black hole. The instrument used to capture the image, the Event Horizon Telescope, let's just call it the EHT, is actually a network of several instruments uh, it's spread out across eight observatories on uh, six mountains and four continents. The EHT gathered the material for its picture from a distance of about 55 million light years. That's the distance between Earth and the heart of the Messier 87 galaxy where this black hole resides. So to give you an idea of the scale of this, one light year, uh, the distance light travels in one year, is roughly 6 trillion miles. So multiply 55 million by 6 trillion, and you've got 3.3 times 10 to the 20th power, or 33 followed by 19 zeros worth of miles. Just to throw another number at you, the weight of the black hole itself is estimated at about 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun which itself, the sun, weighs 4.4 times 10 to the 30th power pounds. Not even going to do the math on that one. But EHT gets its name from something called the event horizon of a black hole. An event horizon is basically the edge of a black hole. After a star has burned itself out, the leftover matter collapses under its own weight and creates this immense hole in space. Uh, the gravitational pull at the center of the hole is so powerful that anything that passes the event horizon can't escape it. Past the event horizon of a black hole, light is trapped, and even space and time are warped. What well, looks like the ring of fire around the center is light, light that's being pulled not only into but around the black hole by the force of gravity. But it, interestingly, this is just the light we can see. It turns out that there's still light even in the center of the black hole, this light that the black hole has swallowed hasn't been extinguished. We just can't see it. What are human beings that the creator of a universe with black holes 6.5 billion times the weight of the sun is mindful of them? What are human beings that they have been given light and soil and sky and sea in the midst of a vast cosmic wilderness? The work of physical scientists in the last century and into our own has shown us that the universe is far bigger and far wilder than we could ever imagine. Stars implode and plummet into immense darkness, light bends and disappears, and space and time themselves defy our expectations. The universe itself keeps expanding at an ever-increasing speed. Even as we develop further technology to analyze and comprehend the world, the wildness and magnitude of the world resists our attempts at comprehension. Even as we seek to further tame and control our little slice of Earth, we are confronted by a cosmos that mocks our attempts at control. The author of Psalm 8 knew a couple thousand years ago what we are having to relearn today, that the universe is vast and the forces at play are far beyond our understanding, much less our control. Looking up at the night sky, the psalmist stands at the edge of a mystery, taking in the immensity of the darkness and the radiance of the moon and the stars. Our author is confronted not only by the mystery of the created order, but by the even greater mysterium tremendum, the tremendous and at times terrifying mystery of what God is. When I behold the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars you have set in place, what is man that you have been mindful of him, mortal man that you have taken note of him? The, the translation we read from this morning is the Tanakh translation it's from the Jewish Publication Society. I recognize that the masculine language used in this translation can feel exclusive, but 
there's something that's lost in the way that other versions translate verse 5 with the phrase human beings. And what's lost is the particularity of the question, the way it focuses on a single human life in the midst of the mystery and power of the created order. What's lost is the contrast between the immensity of creation and the smallness of the creature. So the question in verse 5 isn't, what are human beings in general that God is mindful of them? In Hebrew, the question is, what is Adam? What is the creature of the ground? And how could it be that a creature so small is cared for by a creator so great as to set the moon and stars in their place? Our author doesn't directly answer this question. Instead, the psalm just continues in a kind of run-on statement of wonder at the place humans have in creation. You have made him little less than divine and adorned him with glory and majesty. You have made him master over your handiwork, laying the world at his feet. Sheep and oxen, all of them, and wild beasts too. The birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever travels the paths of the seas. For the psalmist, Adam is a creature with profound dignity. In this way, the psalmist echoes Genesis. Humans are made in the image of God, and being made in the image of God, both male and female share in God's kavod, God's glory that spreads throughout the earth, but that's present in a unique way in a human being. To put it in the words of Irenaeus, the second century uh, bishop and theologian, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. Human beings, by virtue of their unique relationship with God, are given an inalienable dignity, a dignity that, given by God alone, cannot be taken away. Psalm 8 gives us a view of human beings that's a remarkable mixture of humility and pride. We are, to take the Hebrew in verse 5, literally, children of the ground. We are made from the earth, we return to the earth, and so share the same life and fate as the beasts of the field and birds of the air and fish of the sea. And yet, at the same time, we are also made little less than divine. For the psalmist, this means that we are meant to be both bearers and respecters of the dignity that comes to us from sharing in God's glory. And it means that we are given the knowledge and skill and the responsibility to be stewards of creation. So Adam is a creature among other creatures, but a creature that has had the world laid at its feet. When I hear Psalm 8, I can't help but hear Annie Dillard's words in her book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Uh, Dillard writes this, We don't know what's going on here. If these tremendous events or random combinations of matter run amok, the yield of millions of monkeys at millions of typewriters, then what is it in us that they ignite? We don't know. Our life is a faint tracing on the surface of mystery, like the idle, curved tunnels of a leaf miner on the surface of a leaf. We must somehow take a wider view, look at the whole landscape, really see it, and describe what's going on here. Then we can at least wail the right question into the swaddling band of darkness, or, if it comes to that, choir the proper praise. What strikes me here is Dillard's humility and honesty. She herself has taken the wider view, a clear-eyed look at the world, and has told us something true about it. We don't know what's going on here. No matter how much information we gather about black holes and distant galaxies, human, be human beings will still be ignorant about almost everything in the universe and will still be incredibly small in relation to it. But our author, the psalmist, has also taken the wider view. But the difference is that for the psalmist, our ignorance and our smallness don't mean that we're left merely howl questions into a swaddling band of darkness. The recognition of our smallness for the psalmist does, in fact, come to praise. It comes to praise because neither moon nor stars nor black holes, despite their beauty and immensity, have been crowned with glory like the creature Adam. None of these shares the kind of relation to the creator that this small, ignorant creature shares. Our author choirs his praise, in other words, because he has experienced grace. 
an incomprehensible gift. A relationship founded on generosity and care that he has done nothing to earn. But I think there's more at stake here than poetic truth. As far as I can see, the conviction that every human being possesses a profound and inalienable dignity has largely been rejected by our society. If not in word, then certainly in fact. This is true not only in our country's political life, though the rejection is maybe the most blatant here. Entire entertainment industries make their profit from the exploitation and degradation of women. Internet technology has stunted our capacity for compassion for a live and embodied human person and has consequently made the spread of prejudice and hatred far easier. The notion that we share a common life and fate with the beasts of the field and birds of the air and fish of the sea seems to have long since been abandoned. Our response to having a world of harmony and abundance laid at our feet has shown us to be anything but good stewards of creation. Describing the mentality of the early settlers of our country, Wendell Berry has written that, the idea was that when faced with abundance, one should consume abundantly, an idea that has survived to become the basis of our present economy. Barry wrote those words 50 years ago, but they are no less true today. Our consumption and domination of the created order has not slowed down, and the consequences for non-human life in this world have been terrible. The world has been laid at our feet, and we have made a mess of it. But even the light that has collapsed into a black hole isn't entirely extinguished. It's still there, we just can't see it. If the light and grace and dignity that God has given to us seem to have been engulfed in a black hole of political turmoil and ecological destruction, then maybe the psalmist can help us see that not quite everything has been lost. There's still light in there, we just can't see it. But maybe the psalmist can help us see it again or at least catch glimpses of it. Because I do think there's something here in Psalm 8 that can help us recover a sense of human dignity and purpose, even when these seem lost. For the author of Psalm 8, the existence of human dignity and purpose is not dependent on our successes or failures. Our dignity as humans is not founded on our ability to build telescopes that see to the utter reaches of the farthest galaxies, our ability to master the physics of black holes, or the grades we make, or our job performance, or to what extent we are killing the game and life in general. In fact, it's not founded on any ability, physical, mental, or otherwise. It's not founded on our social status, our titles as scientist, student, professor, preacher, president, owner, manager, executive officer, or the rest. Instead, according to the psalmist, human dignity, your dignity and my dignity, is founded on something that is itself not seen, but that enables us to see everything else rightly. And that is grace. In the same way, our human purpose to respect one another's dignity and to steward the created order cannot be fulfilled by our knowledge and skill alone but by grace, an incomprehensible gift from the creator of the moon and stars and black holes, a relationship founded on generosity and care that we have done nothing to earn, but that nevertheless lays a world of possibility at our feet. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for the many good gifts that you have laid at our feet. And God, the dignity that you have given us and the purpose that you have given us to be stewards of your creation. Oh God, we confess that we have not respected one another's dignity and we have not been the stewards of creation that you intended. 
forgive us, God, and help us to see, help us to see the light and the glory and the dignity that you have given to us through your grace, O oh God, and help us to live in a way that acknowledges and gives thanks for your gifts in every part of our lives. In Christ's name, amen.